Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Framerate is brought to you by MailRoute.info. MailRoute is a secure hosted service that provides enterprise-grade virus and spam filtering to companies of any size. Try it right now absolutely free at MailRoute.info. since the Black Mesa incident. In an instant, our world changed as they began taking over. We are the resistance, and we are still fighting. Shepard. Wake up and smell the ashes. Welcome to Frame Rate Episode 9 of our Gold Episodes. Welcome to all our Platinum members. I'm Tom Merritt. <laughs> and welcome to the Diamond Club. I'm Brian Brushwood. I this am the episode actually that Tom Merritt. Happen. Yes. Yeah, I was, about to, I was about to say, because this is our Bizarro episode, because you don't sound anything like Tom Merritt, and I don't look anything like Brian Brushwood on this crappy webcam with bizarre dark, mysterious villain lighting that I have right now. Yeah, if you're on the audio version, you're not going to believe I'm me. If you're on the video version, you're not going to believe Brian's him. That's right. That's right. But I'm glad we were able to pull it off. Thanks for sticking around, Tom. I'm sorry I was having some tech issues. But I, you almost wanted to push this episode off, but I said, dude, I will do anything to keep this going because this is too good an episode. We are too much not going to back down. Awesome We've got stuff is going on. Big stories, other big stories, maybe another big story. And, and film you film. really do sound terrible, Tom. I know. <laughs> Your voice doesn't sound anything like Tom Merritt. Well, maybe, maybe yesterday on Forecast, they were saying that I ought to try to talk like Bill Clinton. <laughs> and it made it sure. work a little better. Hey, man, it's the Bizarro episode. You can talk any way you want. I don't think there's any, any downside on it. So, so Brian, are you ready Brian, to Brian, if I could just get you to get me a cheeseburger I just uh, want, yes. and some small fries. Well, no, wait a minute. Supersize those fries. Done. Uh, you got it, boss. And, Anything uh, else? While you're gone, if you just send Monica in here, that'd be great. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so one quick note. That show, uh, that, uh, Beyond Black Mesa, that trailer had come out a long, long time ago. It was only a minute and a half long. It's totally fan-made, a uh, small independent film project. And if you've ever played any of the Half-Life 2 or, ex or any of the extended Half-Life Universe stuff, you can see they got all the little things exactly right, and the full 10-minute featurette just came out. It's, it really is full of win. It's very much worth checking out, especially if you've ever... Would you go see a Half-Life movie, Tom? I probably would. I probably would. Because as, as, as soon as that Black Mesa came up when he mentioned that, and, and I knew, I'm like, okay, I know exactly what this is. S still Alive started just running through my head uh, nonstop. Yeah. I couldn't stop it. Awesome. Awesome. So, uh, uh, yes. Well, good. Well, are you ready to jump into the big story? 
Let's jump into the big story. This just in, the big story. And the big story today is that Roger Ebert is now convinced, finally, that 3D does not work. 3D yeah, is closed. bunk and it will fail. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, man, Roger Ebert, I loved so very much, and it kills me to see him just become Professor Pouty Pants for everything of the internet. When did he become the internet's crap on everything guy? I think he's, I think in this case, he's giving us a much needed uh, double, you know, like double check, gut check on 3D. He got a letter from Walter Murch who is one of the, uh, or as Ebert puts it, one of the most respected film editors and sound designers in modern cinema. Uh, he has one, he has edited on a movieola. He edited the movie Julia. He edited The Godfather Part 3, A Ghost and Apocalypse Now using a KEM flatbed. He edited The English Patient using Avid. And he edited Cold Mountain using Final Cut Pro on a Power Mac G4. So the guy knows editing. In all of its sure. uh, all of its forms, and what he says is, uh, 3D images are dark, and the biggest problem is that you have to focus your your eyes at a different point than the screen, and that's different from any other time you're looking at anything. Uh, it's the convergence focus issue, he says. Uh, the deeper the audience must focus their eyes at the plane of the screen that's say 80 foot away. But the image is converging 60 feet away because of the 3D effect. And that causes a strain on your vision system. It causes you uh, to, to actually have more problems with peripheral vision and things in the, in the edges of film. And it causes you to actually narrow the field of view. So even if you're on an IMAX screen, you're not getting this big immersive, it's surrounding me feeling if you're watching it in 3D. It actually narrows it. Did you ever watch King of the Hill? I have. Yes, I was. I was. I'm a Mike Judge fan, actually. Did Did you ever see the episode where Bobby takes a community college course on comedy? Uh, no, I don't think I, I don't think I remember that one. Well, this professor, he's got this whole. You know, every comedy has three phases. There's the ha, the ha ha, and then the funny ha ha. You know, and and he, he teaches them how to set up jokes and everything. You know, the, this is the proper way of comedy because I wrote papers on it, and there's a proof or whatever. And then Bobby goes to perform at the at the talent show, and uh, he's in the middle of about to be doing this prearranged, high-minded Cirque du Soleil you know, stupid comedy farce thing. And then instead, he just wants people to laugh at him. So he starts doing fart jokes and he starts, you know, making noises with his armpit or whatever. And the crowd's going nuts and laughing. And the professor is jumping from the side saying, Bobby, don't accept their laughter. It's ill-informed. That's how I feel about this, this letter. It's like, you know, and that's why nobody should enjoy 3D. It's like, I'm sorry, dude. I had a blast watching Avatar. Mm -hmm. It was super immersive. I felt like I went to another world. And yes, there are technological problems with 3D. And you and I, I'm not the biggest defender of 3D as a platform, especially for the home. You know I'm down on home 3D systems. But it's still novel. It's still immersive. It's still cool. And at least at the theater level, it's getting better. And I don't understand this hate parade that Ebert's leaning. There was somebody tweeted, and I loved it. They were like, um, uh, Ebert came, first Ebert came for the video games, and I did not speak up, for I did not play video oh, games. Oh, that, yeah, that <laughs> Then Ebert came for 3D, and I did not speak up, for I did because not Because I wasn't 3D. in three dimensions. <laughs> yes, exactly. And it's like, uh, I just don't get what's with his hater pants, man. I don't think this is hater pants, though. And the, and the flaw in your argument, if I may, uh, is that with... The comedy club, everybody thought the fart jokes were funny. With 3D movies, plenty of people do not like 3D movies. There's lots of people who are like, I get headaches watching 3D movies. I don't like watching 3D movies. I think it looks crap. So it's not just a professorial, here's why it's bad, you're ill-informed. There's also people out there who are going, oh, this explains why I don't like it. Right, and that's fine. And we will 
we will work towards solving this dilemma. You know, like I said, in, in, a, in another 50, 100 years, televisions will have individual voxels that look like they're, you know, 3D spheres that look different depending on where your eyes are. And it really will look like a window into another, into another dimension. And meanwhile, we'll work closer and closer to it. And you can't put in bold caps your title, 3D will never work. And here's a BS proof why. When the number one highest grossing movie in the history of cinema was a 3D masterpiece. Well, yeah, you can you can do that. I mean, he he, he wrote the title "Why 3D Doesn't Work and Never Will." Case closed. I I agree Troll with bait. you that you, you cannot say case closed. This yeah. is, this is far or from closed. never will. This is a very compelling reason why 3D has problems, but yes. that doesn't mean it never will. That's a that's a yeah. big jump to say like. Well, wait a minute. There's lots of different ways of doing 3D. Uh, there's yes. there, there's programmable materials, you know, programmable sheets that can that can mold themselves. Maybe that combined with the spheres that you're talking about creates a, like a, a, a combination of actual textured screens that can change along with 3D imaging that is not so hard on our eyes. Or, or maybe there's something we haven't even thought of yet beyond well, holograms and beyond anything that allows us to focus and converge at exactly the same point by tricking our eyes. But yes. to, to, to say this will never happen, I agree with you. That's, that's going too far. If, but if I, think this is thing, a, I think this is a valid criticism of current 3D. I, I totally agree. And the title should have been, does 3D drive you nuts? Here's the scientific reason why. And yeah. then it's like, yeah, that's totally fair. That's totally accurate. But Although have, Roger Ebert may not write his own headlines. In a lot of newspapers, the headlines are written by a headline editor. Oh, that's interesting. Maybe that's the case. But if it is the case, uh, regardless, uh, this headline will be laughable in as little as 10 years. This is the equivalent of the misquote of Bill Gates saying, nobody should ever need more than 640K of RAM. Although he never said that. Exactly. I said misquote. But the point yeah. is, it's you never, ever bet against human ingenuity. You will always regret it. Even when, you know, when you go back to that famous bet between Julian Simon and um, the guy who wrote um, uh, The Population Bomb, uh, Paul Ehrlich. Paul, Paul Ehrlich was saying that, uh, look, there's too many people. We're going to run out of everything. And Julian Simon said... Uh, out of all the resources mankind has, the most valuable one is human ingenuity. And so he says, yes, we have a finite amount of, of gold or oil or whatever on the planet, but we'll get more and more creative about how we use it. And I'll bet you that 10 years from now, any three minerals you name, including oil, will be cheaper adjusted for inflation. And Paul Ehrlich took the bet. It was like a $10,000 bet and ended up losing because you don't bet against human ingenuity. And, th and this headline is it's total troll bait. And And... This has nothing to do with the fact that Ebert once personally called me a candidate for the Darwin Awards. Well, yes, it does, but that doesn't undermine <laughs> your point. You still, your your point, your your logic and rhetoric are still balanced. The emotion I behind to, it is probably fueled by that. I need to find the uh, the tweet where he did. He found he found the fake uh, the fake hand stab where it looks like it's a knife experiment gone wrong, and I stabbed my hand. And like most of the world, they thought he thought it was totally real. And so uh, I was very honored to be mocked by uh, by Roger. You know, um, Roger and I are alums of the University of Illinois. No kidding. Yeah, I have eaten a bratwurst at a University of Illinois pregame football ceremony within yards of Roger Ebert. Well, yeah. did he did he call you a candidate for the for the Darwin Awards? No, he didn't talk to me. Well, call, so at least you've been called something by him. That's true. At least I'm on the radar. Yeah. So do we have a, do we have another big story, or is that I, the one big one? No, I, I think we do. We have another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. Kevin Smith. You know Kevin Smith, right? Uh, I've heard of him. Yeah. Has a little show called The Smodcast on the Smodcast Podcast Network. Yeah, so on a podcast. Has he done any movies? Uh, you know what? I finally got uh, everybody howled with outrage. We had Michael Rooker on NSFW show, and I mentioned that I hadn't seen Mallrats. And the internet exploded <laughs> with rage. So that was the last of his I watched on Netflix streaming. Yeah, yeah I've seen a number of his movies. He has, he has done many movies. Uh, and he is now thinking, you know what? I think I'm going to undermine the entire distribution system of Hollywood. I'm going to get rid of studios, and I'm going to distribute directly. 
Uh, I think so. At Sundance, he is premiering his new film, which he originally was going to put up for auction, but instead has decided to buy himself and distribute it personally. And he, he is going to use what he knows of the internet and the film industry to combine to to get rid of what he considers to be an outdated system. He, uh, first of all, annoyed a lot of people because everybody had the impression that he was going to put it up for auction after the after the show. And I think he was intentionally trying to be coy. What he actually tweeted was something along the lines of, we'll show the movie and then we'll sell it right there afterwards, which everyone took to mean there will be an off auction. And so a bunch of people who might have been spending their time elsewhere, showed up and spent their two hours watching the movie to decide if they wanted to buy it and at what price or whatever. Uh, what he meant was, uh, in a coy way, I'm going to announce that the plan from the very beginning is that I'm going to distribute my own movie. So what he said was accurate, but unfortunately everyone took it to, to mean an auction. And so a bunch of people were annoyed with him saying that, you know, that, oh, why'd you waste our time? He's like, hey, man, I didn't waste your time. That's I didn't say anything of the sort. But uh, two things. I think this will be financially a really good thing for Kevin Smith. And this is more of the democratization of of uh, g that that the internet has brought to everything is that every you the rise of the middle class rock star is what we're seeing here where he made this movie on a shoestring budget and in his own words he this is not a new idea when Gone with the Wind came out it opened in one theater and they showed it in that one theater and then they packed it up and then they went to another theater and that's what he's doing right now and I guess the idea is he's gonna go around and sell premium tickets where it'll be some kind of live Kevin Smith smodcast style show and then you'll also watch Red State with everyone and I would imagine it'll be like you know 40 to 60 bucks and then once he's made that four million doing that circuit then he could do traditional releases and and hopefully everything will be profit after that uh, specifically what he railed against in his tweet stream and as he's wont to do on his Twitter feed he writes a freaking novel and just hogs all your your space but in this, he says, uh, it drives them nuts that these movies cost, you know, $4 million to make. And then they spend $9 million on marketing and advertising. And then when the movie only makes $13 million, they call it a commercial flop, saying it lost money. It didn't lose money on the quality of the art. It didn't lose money on the quality of the production or the cost. It lost money on the mistake, mistakes made in the way they marketed it. And I, I suspect, if nothing, this is, this is a very novel thing for us to see nowadays. And I suspect it'll be a very good thing for him in the long run. He also announced he'll be making one more movie after Red State, but he will then retire from the director's chair and plans to focus on the distribution side of the business. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see about that. I mean, I don't think I don't he'll know. never make another movie after that. But I think what he's saying is I'm going to make one more movie after Red State because I've already got it in production. And then I'm going to start focusing on distribution. I want to I want to make this model work. I'm going to take what I learn on Red State and my next movie and try to create a model that other people can use. And I would imagine I in, in a little way, I definitely feel a kinship for what Kevin Smith is going through in that when I quit my day job in 99 to do magic full time, it was a very big deal to quit, you know, a safe, secure job and try to, to be a magician touring around around the world. Uh, and then six years down the road, you know, it got to be like, well, this is what I do. I go out and do the shows and then I come back home. And uh, so much of my experience with Twit and Revision 3 has been very invigorating. It feels like I'm beginning a whole new uh, seen with the podcasting. And so I could see a lot of his enthusiasm and excitement. I w I'm with you. I don't believe for a second he's done done making movies. But in that Stephen King way of like, well, I'm going to give up having to make movies. And I'm going to make them when I want and how I want. Yeah. I think he's, just really, he's really excited to figure out this part of the business and try to see if he can change things. And I think that's really cool. We have, in fact, yet another big story. Yet another big story. We do. But do we no even graphic. have an intro? <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> no one has yet. Yet no one. Stop everything. It's another. It's another yet another big story. Another it's big story. Another big story. We need a yet another big story graphic. Uh, Netflix <laughs> and Time Warner. We had a big conversation about this uh, on a previous frame rate. Previously on frame rate. We talked about this. Uh, and Greg Sandoval over at CNET on his Media Maverick blog has some insight into why Time Warner is bashing Netflix so hard. Apparently, and this this actually comes from uh, one of the Netflix executives, the guy in charge of acquiring all the films from for Netflix, uh, 
they're mad over the fact that Netflix is competing with Time Warner to acquire Warner Brothers content. So, see, this, I don't know. I, yeah, that makes total sense. I'm not going to pretend for one second to know enough about the business to know if they really do care that much about one arm of the business competing against another arm. Because you, you hear about all these stories where it's like Sony is simultaneously suing everyone who makes MP3 players saying that this is all piracy. And then simultaneously another arm of Sony makes an MP3 player because they're, you know, they're, they're all independent elements of, of a large mega, mega thing. I mean, do you think that's right? Do you think that it's, uh, that it's I all? <clears throat> I, think, I think thing? it's one of those things where uh, there's a nice little gentleman's agreement amongst media companies. It's no secret. It definitely exists. They, they, they don't sue each other and they don't compete in certain arenas. And I think the idea of, say, Universal coming in and bidding up Warner Brothers content would violate that. And, 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 uh, and Time Warner would, would feel miffed. And so Netflix comes along and says, hey, we're not part of this gentleman's agreement. We're going to bid on that stuff. We want it. And wow. Time Warner's like, well, wait, wait a minute. We have this little internal bookkeeping system that works for us. And, you know, we just take the Warner Brothers and we put it on the TNT. And no, well, we want it. And the, there's antitrust, Sarbanes-Oxley, all this other stuff where they have to allow them to buy it. But because, you know, in good faith, if there's good faith negotiating going on, they can't, they can't have the TNT people come in and kill the Warner Brothers deal. So if the Warner Brothers folks are like, yeah, we, that's a good deal. We should take that. They got to take it. I tell you. Uh, I'm always happy to see whatever the establishment is shaken up. Like in general, I just feel like even if it's ugly in the short term, I love seeing what it does long term. And Netflix, man, their streaming system uh, it just comes out of nowhere and it's so good and it's just getting better and better and better. I just last night was poking around the science fiction stuff in there so much, so much bizarre. It's, it's come up to where now, anytime I mention a movie, previous like 1995, more often than not, I'll call up Netflix and it'll be like, oh, it's right here. I mean, it's it's awesome. You just have you you have your own library and it just magically grows on its own. It's awesome. Uh, you know what else is awesome? What else is awesome, Tom Merritt? Not having spam. What? Yeah. Now, see, you you keep telling me that I can have no spam, but like, if I've got certain sacrifice emails, right? There's certain addresses that you just give out to everyone and you stop even checking because they've been around so long and they're so full of spam that there's no way that you can possibly find anything useful in there. Do you have, do you have any email, uh, emails like that? Used to. Used to have really? one like that. Ace Detect at Subbrilliant.com used to be like that, yeah. See, like just then, you just mentioned it on the air, which I assume means all of a sudden you're signed up for every spam that could be out there. Well, it used to mean that, yeah, but not anymore. Wait, well, you guys got a magic wand? You yeah, kind of, kind of. It's, uh, it's called MailRoute, mailroute.info. But uh, well, what does it do? Well, you, what, it, you, what it does is uh, it, it takes all of my email, and it looks at it and decides whether it's real email or spam, and then it only sends me the real emails. Wait, so like it sends it, so they got like a team of like immigrants who pour over all your emails? No, it's they just, read a, all it's your just an algorithm uh, created by Tom Johnson. Well, I'm... But it's got to be like super complicated to set up, right? Like you got to. Uh, well, you know, if you, if you run your own host, uh, you you might you might know how to edit your MX record. But you could if you don't run your own host and somebody runs it for you, you can get them to do it. Uh, it's that's that's all you need to do. So I can just make a call to my ISP that runs schwood.com and say, uh, Hey, I need you to edit this MX record and add a line because yeah. then I emailed a mail route. Yeah. And they will call out all the spam. Uh, but I bet I bet they have a ton of false positives though. No. Nope. I bet all of a sudden what? No. Nope. No, no false positives. Wait, no, none? I, I haven't, I haven't had one yet. Man, well, how would one sign up for this product and/or service? Well, Brian, uh, we should probably get back to the show, but <laughs> mailroute.info is the uh, is the URL if you if you were interested in that. Uh, well, and it's big, like it's like Big O Tito in the chat room just said he would pay five thousand dollars for that. Well, so dude, he's gonna, I got to assume it's got to be twice that much. I'm going to tell Tom Johnson that he should charge him five thousand dollars, but most people will only have to pay thirty dollars uh, per year for a single $30 year. Thirty dollars a year? Yeah. That's like that's like less than nine cents per day. That's and like that's no like you've got spam. a hole in your pocket and a dime falls out every day and you don't even notice. That's amazing. Yeah. All right. Done. I'm down. All right. 
Wait, let's let's get back to the show. We should just stop having these personal conversations. Time yeah, for you know, and, and it is a little bit unprofessional. Here we yeah. are live on frame rate, and all yeah. of a sudden we have a personal conversation about topics that are of interest to us, like spam. So let's get back to, to being on task here. <laughs> Time for film film. <laughs> I'm very sad about our first story in Film Found because I so wanted it to be true. Uh, Which one? There was a there was a rumor earlier this week that Keanu Reeves had told an audience that he was in talks with the Wachowski brothers to make two sequels to The Matrix. Yeah, in 3D, and yeah, yeah. Uh, and they they actually had like fake quotes from Keanu Reeves saying. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be bigger and better than ever. Get ready for a Neo you've never seen before. Yeah. The, 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 and they, they had, uh, apparently the Wachowskis had met with James Cameron to, to find out yes. like how the, how the best way to shoot it in 3D was. And I'll be honest, I actually wanted to see it. I, I did. Well, I'll tell you what. I, everyone, I, I, as bad as the two sequels were, I was like, maybe they'll do it right this time. But I'll tell you, okay, first of all, do, do you know that what was supposed to be, and I'm hearing all this third hand, but the way I heard the story is that originally, after the success of The Matrix, the Wachowski brothers said, we want to do two more movies. The second one will take place years before the first movie and will tell the story of the rise of the machines. The third will talk about the, the final conflict between man and machine and how they, how they work everything out, uh, which thematically would be amazing and awesome. However... The, the studios being in the money business and not being owned by Kevin Smith, yeah. the studios say, uh, look, we're not going to have a Matrix without Keanu Reeves and Are Carrie Ann Boss and, uh, and Lawrence Fishburne. Are you crazy? I mean, no, 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 no. They, so they, they actually they did this uh, in the Twilight Saga, which I know a lot of the audience probably hasn't bothered to see. But th the character of Edward Cullen is not really in the second book. Really? So they had to kind of force him into the movie because it's like, well, crap, we got to have Team Edwards fans happy. Wow. Well, the uh, uh, in in this case, what I was told was that the the last of the three movies was split into uh, parts two and three in the movie, which makes sense because if you if you watch those two movies, there's really about one movie's worth of stuff in there stretched out over two movies. But then all of the Rise of the Machines prequel stuff ended up showing up in the Animatrix. And if you've never seen the Animatrix, that is maybe the best experience in all of um uh in, in all of the, the Matrix. It it the collection of animation is top notch. The storytelling is top notch. Uh have you watched the Animatrix? The Animatrix is what made me so excited for the sequels. Well exactly because exactly. I, I watched it, the Matrix, loved it, watched Animatrix and was like if this is where they're going with this, this is going to be fantastic. I'm really excited. Yes. Then we watched Matrix Reloaded and got loaded yeah. to try to forget it. Yeah. No, actually, uh, Reloaded and Revolutions feel like one movie. That, that That's yes. exactly what's what's going on there. They should not have done that. Well, I agree. I I definitely as as big of a disappointment the last two movies were. My love for the Animatrix is so great. You definitely need to watch it on Insta streaming right now, wherever you can get a hold of it. It is so good that I definitely would instantly sign up for more Matrixy stuff, especially if they if they weren't under the thumb of any big production company. What about more Star Trek? Uh, original Star Trek, not not reboot Star Trek. We're going to get another Star Trek movie, but would you would you like to see something that had two Captain Kirks, two Jedi Knights, two Darth Vaders all in one movie? What is this? Some kind of bizarre pornographic mashup on the internet? Sort of. Uh it's <laughs> it's actually it's actually not on the it's, internet. It's slash fic. Nor is it pornographic. Captain Kirk totally made out with Darth Vader. But it is some kind of uh this past Saturday on January 22nd at the Louisville Science Center Museum in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, Robert Picardo, who played the doctor on Voyager, uh, and Please producer nature of medical emergency, producer, director, writer, Dr. Harry Kluwer hosted the premiere of Quantum Quest, a, a long, long anticipated in the Trek community, 3D computer animated large format adventure film. Uh, at a preview party of Science with a Twist, an evening aboard the Enterprise, features the voices of William Shatner, Chris Pine, 
the new Star Trek uh, uh, nice. Captain Kirk, Mark Hamill and Samuel Jackson, James Earl Jones and Hayden Christensen, among others, including uh, uh, Neil Armstrong. So it's just a, a, a oh, cool. Whoa, 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 whoa. You don't get to be like, uh, oh, and some other people like um, Neil Armstrong. The guy set foot on the moon, the first human being to walk on the moon, and you dropped him off in your last breath as a footnote? This is the first time he's ever lent his voice. This guy doesn't hardly do interviews or nothing. It's Neil freaking Armstrong. That you you well, buried the lead, man. He, Neil Armstrong, you know, two he, Darth Vaders, and some Captain Kirks. I was I well, I didn't want to, you know, because he messed up his line. <laughs> did he? <laughs> oh, did one small, small step, step for a man. For a man. He, he, hey, they vindicate him, man. They they had voice experts go back and say he said for a man, for a man, for a man, for a man, for a man. For one, man. one small step for a man. You know, giant leap for a man. Uh, <laughs> yes, no, Neil Armstrong is pretty awesome. Uh, the whole Quantum Quest thing looks good. Uh, and this thing will be uh, showing at museums and planetariums and things like that. So you might want to check out and see if it's coming to a theater near you. Uh, finally, Anne Hathaway has been uh, signed on to play Catwoman in The Dark Knight Rises. What do you, what do you think? Is, is Anne Hathaway sweet Anne Hathaway Catwoman for you? I don't know. And can I just tell you, you're going to have to remind me what Anne Hathaway has been in that I've seen because her name didn't instantly bring anything to mind. Devil mom. Wears Prada. Uh, see, strangely, not the kind of movie I'd watch. Didn't seen, see seen that one. seen the trailer for it, though, haven't you? Uh, oh, no. No, I don't think I have. Is, is she, like, super hot? Uh, she's, like, brunette, big eyes, girl next door hot. There she is. Yeah. Okay. Well, there well, she's not brunette. There's that. That's a. Re I'm sorry, IMDb. So but you shouldn't do that. That's that's not what you normally. <laughs> you should be like. listening to the show, IMDb. <laughs> well, no, but that's like the, you look at all the other pictures down below. You can see what she looks like. But the yeah. one up there, she's got brown hair, like dyed hair. What the hell's that about? What's the What's the complaint that she's not slutty enough? She was in Get Smart. She was in that's Broke the complaint. Back. She was in Brokeback Mountain. No, that's those aren't the complaints. I, I I don't think there's a complaint here. It's just that she generally plays a very sweet person. Although uh, one of the the things that I've actually really enjoyed watching her in was was it Love and Other Drugs? Is that the one I'm thinking of? Uh, yeah, I think I think so. No, Rachel getting married, uh, indie film where she plays kind of the falling apart sister. Uh, who who's really wrecking things during her sister's getting ready for being married, and she's a smoker, and she's neurotic, and all this stuff. So I think what they're doing is they want somebody who appears very sweet and mellow and lovely and then can also do Catwoman when she puts on the cat suit, which is what they did with Michelle Pfeiffer. Yes. Well, and Michelle Pfeiffer was able to pull off the uh, the timid secretary transformed into the sex kitten act, and... Uh, I don't know if it has to do with me being, you know, like 17 when that came out, but uh, certainly I thought she did a good job. But I always but the, think Eartha Kitt. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. The original Catwoman from the TV series. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's Catwoman. How come we don't have, like, Queen Latifah playing Catwoman? Oh, that would be wild, dude. That'd be awesome. That's what they should they should have cast like uh, wildly different. That would have been amazing. All I know is that the entire internet exploded with annoyance at that announcement and it was probably unfounded and but who knows maybe maybe finally i mean i don't know wait i i've gotten so much flack for me not being crazy oh, i'm, I'm getting I, i'm right? also getting flack i i forgot julie newmar julie newmar was the original eartha kit was 60s so there, okay. there was a Catwoman before before eartha. well like i'm not gonna hold anything against it look uh the one story that that we probably should have covered that everyone else in the world's covering is of course they made the oscar announcements i do want to give a nod to out of everything with the Oscar announcements and the nominations, the only one I really cared about is the fact that Christopher Nolan got snubbed for Best Director for Inception. Now, when you look at Inception, of everything, mm. of, the, of the writing, of the music, of the acting, the thing that stands out the most to everyone is the incredible direction. They're calling it, they're, they're saying it's positively Hitchcockian. This is what we're going to remember 100 years from now from Christopher Nolan. No Oscar nom. Yeah, well, because it was all about the story. What? No, no. It's the visuals. Come on, man. Yeah, you know, uh, the Social Network got uh, a director nomination. 
And that's fine. I, I'm a tremendous David Fincher fan. I think David Fincher is a fantastic And he did a fine job. But yeah. put, put, put those, if you've seen both those movies, think about that for a second. Yeah. Well, that's like, that's like uh, the year that, uh, man, the Oscars are so stupidly political. Do you remember the year that Shakespeare in Love beat Saving Private Ryan for Best Picture? <laughs> yes, I do. Forget and I, it. And I agree with that. Because it's Shakespeare really? in Love. <laughs> Oh my God. What's right. not to like? All right, I'm done. No, I'm done no, with no. movies. Let's go hey, watch. Did, let's go did, watch some tube tops. Did, no, no, did you watch any? Uh, did you watch any movies? No, I haven't seen I, anything. I gotta, it's, been, I, it's been a crazy busy. I got to tell this story real quick. I went to see the I, King's Speech this weekend. Is it good? It was fantastic, and I think Colin Firth picture? absolutely deserves an Oscar. I don't know if it's best picture, but it's, it definitely deserves consideration. I think Colin Firth probably best actor though. Like he he was incredible in it. Uh, but, uh, you know, sh so, should I know anything about it going in, or should I just watch it flat? No, out? You, you know, the only thing to know about it is that um, here, here's my my viewer's guide to the King's speech. Uh, you should know that King George the Sixth was the current Queen Elizabeth's father, and that he was called Albert before he became king. He changes his name. They explain that in the in the movie. So when you're okay. seeing Albert and he's got a daughter Elizabeth, that's Elizabeth. Um, I see. His brother was called David, but his name was actually Edward, and he became King Edward the Seventh or, or the Eighth. King Edward the Eighth, who abdicated the throne to marry a divorcee. So when you're watching this, if you have a little of that background, you're like, oh, David, that's the guy who's eventually going to be king and abdicate to marry the American divorcee. Oh, Albert, that's the guy who's going to end up being King George VI during World War II, and he's Elizabeth's dad. You got that in your head? Everything else yeah. in the movie will, will be awesome. All right. Well, I'm with you then. I'll have, to, I'll have to go check it out. Yeah, I was, you know, me and George Lucas were watching it. and uh, Oh, I, that's I, right. You I, just I think... dropped that. You mentioned it in your Twitter. You're like, oh, by the way, watching a movie with me and George Lucas. Oh. Just the two of us. Oh, I, did, I didn't mean a name drop there. <laughs> exactly. I was four rows in front of him. No, it was weird, man. It was just, I, I talked about this on East Meets West too, but it was just one of those moments in Marin uh, Marin County, where George Lucas, he lives here, and people are used to seeing him around. He just goes to diners, goes to movies in the regular old theater. Uh, so, you know, we go in to get in line to buy our tickets, and there, like, you know, six people in front of us in line buying his ticket to go see the King's Speech is George Lucas, and he goes and he buys his popcorn, and, you know, what I'm telling you should not be odd. It's a guy standing in line getting a theater ticket and buying popcorn. It's not that unusual, but right. when you just watched Red Letter Media... And oh then, my gosh! And then you go and get in line, and you see the guy who was in Red Letter Media being made fun of. You're like, "That's real life." That wow! But nobody, you, nobody bugged him. Nobody bothered him. He was just going about his business. Everybody was very respectful. We're all guilty of turning people into objects, you know. Especially in this kind, especially when we judge their art and we we project onto them the reasons for why they made the decisions they did. Uh, but it's like at the end of the day, you got to remember. Um, George Lucas turns out human being. Yeah. Did you know that? Well, and, Not and Darth Vader. It, it just takes a little while to get over that. This is some person that I have seen on a screen a lot. Yeah. And then, you know, and then that passes. <laughs> the chat room wants to know if you just yelled, Han shot first. I got so many people uh, on Twitter saying that I should do that. No, of course I didn't. <laughs> My guess is it's not fun for George Lucas anymore. No. Like, uh, let me guess. I raped your childhood. I ruined everything that was precious to you. Can I go watch the movie now? I, I hear just want to eat my popcorn and watch the <laughs> King's speech with my son. Okay? And yes, I am his father. Okay. Have we got that out of the way? All right. Let's go on to two tops. If you do nothing else this week, you must watch the sci-fi movie on Saturday night starring Tiffany and Deborah Gibson. Now, are, are they starring or they have a small role in it? Well, I don't know if they have a small role, but they are starring. <laughs> as far as you're concerned, oh, they're yeah. the stars of the show. I mean, yeah, oh, okay. Uh, you want to put it that way. They are They are co-starring alongside Megapython and Gatoroid in Megapython versus Gatoroid. Megapython and Gatoroid featuring Tiffany and Debbie Gibson. Yes. Oh, this is awesome. I cannot wait until I'm a washout has-been that shows up in a sci-fi movie. That will be the pinnacle of my career. 
Tiffany thinks she's alone now, but then Debbie <laughs> shakes her love. That's right. She shows her electric youth. Uh, and slaughters her. Deborah Gibson, let's, let, that's how she goes these days. She's no longer Debbie. Portrays a fanatical animal rights advocate who frees illegally imported exotic snakes from pet stores while Tiffany plays an overzealous park ranger worried about the growing ecological damage. But the thing we really want to see is the fight between the two of them. And I'm watching it right now, and in my mind, all I'm hearing is <laughs> Oh my god. Uh, this is awesome. I will definitely uh, pretend like I'm going to watch this this weekend. <laughs> I've already got it. <laughs> sure I just saw everything I needed to see out of it. You, you kind of did, yeah. Uh, also, uh, io9 has a good article up about what to expect from the new Battlestar Galactica prequel, now that Caprica is canceled, uh, Blood and Chrome. And you know they what? put out casting calls for the three main characters. Blood and Chrome is going to be the story of a young Adama as he signs up to fight against the Cylon uprising. This, I read this whole article, and I could not be more excited for this project. I think Caprica was well-intentioned, but uh, uh, but this is what, this is the meat. This is what we want. Battlestar Galactica, it's humans kicking robot ass. And, oh, I'm so excited to see young, young Adama, because now, after watching... Um, I, I oh, there's so many things that I want to see out of this. I want to see young Adama become a badass. I want to see him encounter the Galactica as a brand new top of the line ship in its day. I want to see I want to see whether or not they're the old <laughs> toaster designs that they stay true to that. Uh, this this is going to be so freaking great, man. Yeah, this is going to be the style in more ways of the original Battlestar because you can have old Cylons and old Vipers. I'm sure they're going to mess with it a little, but it's got to it's got to stay true to that to a certain extent because they've stayed true to it in all of the other things that they've done. Uh, but they had they had the old Vipers in the new Battlestar yeah, Galactica, exactly, if you exactly. notice. So yeah. it's got to be there. Um, Adama's first assignment, spoiler alert, little bit of spoiler here, is uh, is to a raptor, not to a Viper. Do we, and, have, to, do we have to raise the threat level? I think we should raise spoiler it to alert. Probably raise it to, to yellow. yellow. Yeah. Yes. He's on a Raptor, and he is uh, paired with the Raptor's electronic countermeasures officer, Coker Fasjevic, who loves the Raptor and loves Wait, the name Galactica. Is, his name is Coker Fasjevic? Maybe it's Fasjevic. I don't know. It's a, it's there's like, a J it's like, in there. You know, why don't they call it, you know, as and his partner, heroin slow guy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Uh, Coker, if you read Coker, um, it turns out it's, it's essentially Colonel Ty. I mean, oh, that's awesome. what the, what this shows to me is that they originally thought Colonel Ty and Adama had come up in the ranks together and they were starting to think about a backstory. And then at the last moment they made Ty, spoiler alert, this is, this is red, this yeah. is red. Wow, we're at red. We've never gone to red like this. Go on. They made Ty a Cylon. Okay, we can bring it back down to yellow. Uh, All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so they couldn't have him grow up with Adama anymore. So they, I think they've made up this Coker character to sort of be that Ty-like character. Coker McFast and Fast. Yeah. Because Coker's and a drinker. Sleepy. He's Not. a drinker. And he's old and crusty, just yeah. like Colonel Ty. Hey, have you have you played a lot of games where the the actor who played uh, uh, Michael Hogan, the uh, no, is it Michael Hogan? Yeah, the guy yeah. who played Ty. Hogan. Uh, yeah, yeah. Have you have you heard his name? His his voice show up in a bunch of games. Like, I yeah, playing in Mass games and, and on weird um weird guest appearances on like Smallville. He's playing Dark Side. And he was on an episode of Warehouse 13. And, like, he's just, you know, all over the science fiction universe right now. That's awesome. The chat room is giving us all kinds of other other names, like uh, Wino McDrinky. That's <laughs> going to be out there. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, this is great. I could not be more excited about this. I'm also excited about the new J.J. Abrams thing. Yes, J.J. Uh, Abrams is uh, leaking out just the very teensiest bit about his next show called... Alcatraz. Uh, it apparently will involve 
a prison actually on Alcatraz. They're casting for guards and prisoners, and there, it's, it's something about prisoners vanishing and mysteriously reappearing in the present day. FBI agents assigned to track them all down and figure out the truth. So maybe they'll be doing some shooting here in San Francisco. Uh, apparently, they, they're going to do some shooting on the actual Alcatraz. That's awesome. Uh, you know what? Out of everything I saw, only one thing made me an instant fan. I mean, in addition, of course, J.J. Abrams has done a very good job about picking awesome projects. But uh, out of all the casting, one made this an instant watch for me. Do you have a guess who? Sam Neill. No, not Sam Neill. Uh, Jason Butler Harner? No. Jorge Garcia. Yeah, of Hell course. Yeah. That is Hurley. Jorge Wait, Garcia that, will assume the role of Dr. Diego Soto. Hurley is back, baby. Yeah, dude, playing a, they, they called him a hippie geek in there. It's like, I'm sold, man. That's all I need. Yeah, no, this is, I, I think this is going to be much better than Undercovers. Uh, <laughs> do you think? Do I, you suppose, sir? I think Alcatraz will be the next Fringe, not the next Undercovers. Or, uh, or Now, does that, knowing that this is on the horizon, does this in any way relax your white-knuckle grip on keeping Fringe alive? No, no, I need to keep Fringe alive because Fringe is just a good story. Yeah. I mean, that, uh, it had to, it's like, you know, no, nobody thought Fringe was, you know, like, I don't need Lost anymore if you're a big fan of Lost because Fringe is around. Same, same thing. Fringe needs to stay. And, in fact, the ratings were pretty good last Friday. So I, I tell you what, I, the, the, the fans are passionate. Guess I got in the mail. Like, people were like, no, seriously, you need to watch all of Fringe. And I was like, well, I'll get to it. I'll find it somewhere. And then all of a sudden, physical media shows up at my doorstep with Fringe. I'm just like, what? Physical media? In mail? Like actual, wow. That was exciting. That's so illegal. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> I don't know if I, I had like a weird Skype hiccup there. I don't know if we're back on track now. Yeah, we are. Uh, we are. Okay, um, good. So uh, what have you been watching on tele on the television? Did you watch, did you, have you watched some Fringe yet? Uh, no, I did do like you told me to. I set it to my queue. And so we're, we're DVRing Fringe now. And uh, although I need to do like you say, because apparently you say that they're watching whether or not I bother to start the episodes. I have to go over there and start the episode, but not watch it. Right. Yeah. Just to record the episode and then just play it back. But you don't have to watch. You don't have to sit there. You can turn the TV I, off. They can't tell if the TV's on or not. I am plowing through the Venture Brothers, but then unfortunately I had a, a massive computer fail like five days ago. So I'm rebuilding my PC right now. That's taking up all my time. I How about you? I have been watching uh, lots of stuff. Actually, I watched the premiere and the and the second episode of Being Human U.S. Uh, it's the U.S. version of a of a show from the U.K. that the premise is a werewolf, a vampire, and a ghost all live in a house together, and it's <laughs> much better than it sounds. It it sounds like you know, guy walks into a bar, right? But yeah, right. But it's, it's actually it's actually a metaphor for addiction. Uh, you know, the all all three of these characters are trying to get past their their personal issues, right? So the vampire character is trying to live without without using human blood. The werewolf guy is trying to figure out how to stop the fact that he's a werewolf from ruining his life. And the ghost is trying to figure out, like, why she's there and how to move on. Uh, you know, so it really plays like a 20-somethings roommate drama. But it's more interesting because you got vampires and blood-sucking and werewolves. Have you watched the original or only I have. seen the U.S. I, version? Yeah, I'm, I'm all the way caught up on the original. They just started the third series in the U.K., so I'm going to be behind. Do you think, do you think it does it justice? Over. It's interesting. I was really worried about that. Uh, they changed the names of the characters, and, and the characters are cast quite differently, except for the ghost. Uh, and I, I think they're doing a very good job. They didn't make it cartoony, which if you watch the trailer, it looks like it might be a little cartoony. The way the, right. the the way the colors are, the cinematography, but it's not. Well, it's also, actually quite dark, and they put uh, parental warnings on it. Oh wow! Well, I mean, you got to admit this. Uh, I mean, there's, <laughs> it's this thing just screams uh, easy jokes, you know, the entire time. So it's like uh, if they don't go there, that sounds all the more awesome. I don't mind the occasional, you know, chuckle on on that kind of setup, but it's like uh, they they throw it, out some one liners, you know, like yeah, the werewolf guy when when he when the vampire guy in the first episode, and I'm calling him vampire guy and werewolf guy because it's Aiden in the U.S. and it's Mitchell in in on the BBC version, and wait, wait, wait. I don't want to have to pick. Isn't Aiden sounds more Brit British than Mitchell? Well, Aiden 
is uh, dates back. He was made a vampire during the Revolutionary War. Okay. So he's got an old-fashioned name. Um, anyway, uh, a, the, the, the vampire guy says we should get a place together to the werewolf guy. And the werewolf guy is like, great. Yeah, that'll be fun. We'll invite the neighbors over and eat them. <laughs> you know, there's so there's some throwaway lines like that, but but the situations aren't really funny usually. Yeah. Uh, well, that's good. I also watched uh, an episode of Ten Speed and Brown Shoe last night. I was very happy. Okay, we talked about this, and and was it good? It actually held up. I was really, really I was I was ready to have a nice nostalgic experience, and then not really want to watch it again. Uh, but it's it's a pretty good story, you know. All it's, right. It's actually got got some legs to it. Um, the issue is the DVD that you get from Amazon doesn't have the pilot on it. So you have no idea how you got here? Yeah, so you, you can't watch the pilot episode again because CBS owns the pilot and they couldn't get the rights to that. Oh, so they God, only have the 12 regular season episodes. Yeah, on. I know. It's like, look, how do you expect people to be good and well-behaved about respecting copyright law when you go out of your way to make it so obstinate and unhelpful for idiotic reasons. This is the, You're not helping your cause, big media people, when you do stuff like that. You're just encouraging people. Like, like I'm not going to lie. Uh, I've gotten very, very good about buying all of my media. But when something's flat out not available uh, and, and, you know, anywhere – then it's like there's no other choice. I'm not going to not watch it. I'll just grab it from a source you're not going to like. Yeah. You, you should not do that. But what choice I, do they give right. you? You know? I want to not do that. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, move on to what you're watching, you people in the audience. Show at gmail.com. Yeah, we got a lot of a uh, lot of responses on this stuff. Uh, one of them a little bit long. I'll start off here with the uh, first one from Jason Martin. Hey, guys, here's a supposed image from the new Thundercats cartoon that FilmSack just tweeted. I believe this is just minutes ago. I know it's only one image, but I like the design. Jason from Hothchester, New York. No kidding. You live in Hothchester? That's awesome. I would open a cantina there instantly. Uh, this doesn't look terribly different from the old Thundercats. It does look a little bit spit-shined. Yeah, a it looks bit. a little animated. Which, which is, that's fine. I mean, golly, did I ever love Thundercats yeah, I when I was a kid. Fan. It was such a, so, uh, such weird, advanced sci-fi ideas that when I was a kid, I don't think I realized how out there they were. The idea that Lionel's 12 years old, but all of a sudden wakes up in a body of a man when they crash land and he gets out of hypersleep and stuff in this strange world that they've crash landed onto that's not hospitable or rains rocks and everything. Uh, I love it. Did you ever watch Thundercats? Yeah, Thundercats were go. The, uh, uh, do you remember the, uh, the trials of Lionel when all of a sudden all of his teammates became his enemies and he had to, he had to pass the trials? I don't remember that, no. He had to outrun Chitara, and, he, and at first he thought it was impossible, but he realized that, you know, if you just ran far enough and long enough, you know, it was, it was a game of endurance, not of speed, and uh, he had to outthink uh, Panther, and he had to, you know, outmaneuver the skills of Kit and Cat. It was all oh, so great, so cool. So you're excited. You're more excited. You're, you're the most excited. I really am. I really yeah. am. I'm not going to lie. But I'm mainly because it's like I can't wait to share that with my daughter. When you have a seven-year-old, it makes it so much easier to get excited about stuff because it's like now I can watch them again with her. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, one more uh, email before we head out. Yeah, you got it. You, you want me to read this? Yeah, why don't it? you? Okay, this is, the, this is a longer one here. We got a lot of responses on uh, uh, about uh, the Netflix conversation and a lot of people correcting us because X-Men First Class is in fact a full-length movie and not a TV series, which, uh, which we were, we were ill-informed upon. So we sincerely apologize. Please stop correcting us. Uh, this one reads, hey guys, just watched episode eight and thoroughly enjoyed your discussion on Netflix. I've been using Netflix since 2007 and love the ability to stream shows and movies. I completely agree with your assessment on where content distribution is headed. In fact, my wife and I recently dropped AT&T U-verse because we couldn't justify paying $74 a month for the 10 channels we watched and the 190 channels we didn't. We now have a Windows Media Center box that records over the air broadcasting, which is a little over 45 channels and sub channels in the Houston area and runs Netflix, Hulu desktop and Boxy in a surprise well integrated setup 
We found that we are actually watching more content on our TV now than when we had UVerse through Media Center. We're recording old and new shows that come in over the air with Netflix and Hulu. We get to watch an enormous library of additional TV and movies. It's also extremely easy to flip over to the Twit app on Boxy and catch recorded shows like with those we watch, like the Watch Live function when we want to tune in live for shows like NSFW. One of the greatest things about doing this is now Netflix is the only service we pay for other than internet service, which we've locked in for $25 a month for a year. That sounds way cheap to me. That's really Should cheap. we ever run out of things to watch, we always have the option of getting Hulu Plus. We're also fine with paying more to Netflix for additional content from companies like HBO because we're not paying the ridiculous amount of money every month for content that we never care about. Keep up the good work on the show. Joey, here's what this tells me. Number one, uh, frustration is mounting in the public. Number two, technical ability is growing in the public to where this kind of talk would have sounded crazy techie six years ago. But I got a feeling there's a lot of regular guys doing it because we're all hip to computers nowadays. And this is what's going to push it that direction, right? Is because if enough people do this, uh, you can no longer say, well, you know, we have to get the this money from here to support this and we got to force you to do it. You either have to cut off your ability to use the Internet for that or... You have to go where the eyeballs are. And in the long run, it's a whole lot easier and a whole lot cheaper to go where the eyes eyeballs are than to try to legislate and cut things off. I'm yeah. not saying it yeah. won't yeah. happen, but it won't happen permanently. The hammer of legislation is not the right tool to handle this kind of stuff. Yeah. For, yeah. Not for, you know, not, not for a government and not for some, you know, sort of legislation of, of monopoly. Where, you know, it's right. like, well, I'm the only internet service provider you can uh, you can count on. So Using I, the bully you know, powers. Yeah, exactly. All right. Thank you, my friend. Uh, hey, man, don't forget, uh, everyone should email us at frameratesshow at gmail.com. Frameratesshow at gmail.com. Uh, we do, uh, we're being pretty good about reading all the letters. I at least uh, send back a little thank you note for your thoughts, and certainly a lot of them bubble up in the show. We love to feature them, but uh, write us. Tell us what you think, frameratesshow at gmail.com. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye, I love you. On the cast road. Sight beyond sight. Sort of orbits.